Think about this. You're me, a normal guy who gets caught in a web of secrets so thick that you could cut it with a clever retort. And there I was, an unintentional spymaster without having taken a single spy class. My life turned into a scary comedy, and every day is a new episode where I play the unlikely hero. It's like MacGyver, but there are more Wi-Fi problems and not as much hair. With only my brains and a bunch of way too smart for their own good gadgets, I had to find my way through a maze of secrets. Every time something beeped, it wasn't just a message, it was the sound of the next plot twist. I wasn't just listening in, I was watching a live feed of my own life, which was turning into a sitcom with the laugh track stuck on hold on. It's like being a cat on a hot tin roof as I try to figure out what the clues mean. You'd laugh as I fumble around setting up cameras like I'm putting together a failed YouTube prank. Hold on tight, because if my life were a movie, you'd be slapping your knee one minute and gripping your seat the next. Pull back the curtain, turn on the spotlight, and let the chaos begin. I first learned that my world wasn't what I thought it was late in the week. I got home early from work. My wife Marge was upstairs. I chose to say hello. I could hear her on the phone as I walked down the hall. I caught the end of the chat as it was ending. Love, yes, today was great. It was good. When did she start to like work? The door to a room was a little open, so I went in. She was on the phone while taking off her clothes. She took off her skirt and put it on the bed. I had never seen her wear black lace pants before. I was about to go in when she told me to hang up. He could come home. I need to take a shower first. I looked. She took off her shirt and put the phone to charge. She wore a black lace top that matched back to me. She took the pants off and threw them away. As she went to the shower, the top came next. She stopped in front of a mirror. I could see her in the mirror from where I was. I felt sick after seeing what I saw. I was sick. She saw a love bite on her left chest in the mirror. There was a mark on my wife that wasn't mine. She saw it too, so she grabbed her chest and touched the mark. She said, oh, no. I need to hide this now. I cried outside our room while she took a shower. This is David Atkinson. I've been married to Marge for 23 years. Julie is 19 years old and Tom is 18 years old. Marge has a part-time job at the Air National Guard base nearby. I work as a chemical engineer. I thought we were living a great life together until just now. My wife seemed to need someone else to make her happy now. When I felt calmer, I went into our bedroom and looked through her phone for the last call she got. I was shocked to find that her phone had a password. We used to share phones all the time and never used passwords. It had been a few months since the last time I used her phone. It never took place. I smelled her shirt when I picked it up. It smelled like aftershave in a way I didn't recognize. I took her underwear and bra out of the laundry basket. As you might expect, there was no sign of cheating on the undies. I gave it some thought. The digital camera and a Ziploc bag are in the kitchen. I put the underwear in the bag and put it in my pocket before going back to the bedroom. I planned to get a kit to look for signs of someone else and bring it to work. The camera was put on my dresser and pointed at the mirror. I set it to record and hit it with a tie. As I went back downstairs, it was pretty well hidden. I tried to check her email since I saw that her laptop was on. Also, no luck there. The key was written on it. Another sign was that we never used passwords on our computers. After that, I left. That made me so mad that I couldn't talk to her about it. I also didn't have any real proof. She could say it wasn't true. Not yet. I needed strong proof and to find out who the other guy was so I could make him pay. While my wife was still in the shower, I called her phone and told her I was late from work and would eat later after hiding her underwear in the garage. I went to the nearby bar to feel bad and think. The old bar was quiet and was next to a rundown motel. It was a place to be alone with some good food and cheap drinks. In the bar, I saw a new girl when I walked in. I thought that was nice. I hope she knows how to make a gin and tonic. She could, too. Her name was Mary. It was her first day. And it was fun to talk to her. It was hard for her because she was a mom and had been married before. Around 11 p.m., I got home. It was quiet in the house. Everyone was sound asleep. I changed in our room. Marge woke up while I was putting on my pajamas. You're running late tonight. I told you I was sorry to wake you up. Had a long day? 
Then I told her, if you missed me, I'll make it up to you. She yawned and said, I'm just too tired right now. In a day or two, maybe? I told her it was a date. I'm going to take a break for a while and then join you. Good night. I took out the recorder when she said night. Then I went downstairs and plugged the camera in. We only saw each other once a week, down from a lot of times a week. At least once a week for the past month. I skipped ahead to the part where the bathroom door opened. She took a close look at herself in the mirror. I saw a mark. That night, she chose pajamas to wear. She usually sleeps without clothes on, so this is strange. The video was saved, and the camera was cleaned. I hid it and then went to bed. I turned up the heat on my way out. Check to see if she still likes her pajamas. When I got into bed, Marge was either asleep or acting like she wasn't there. I got up early on Thursday to leave. I had to take a break and calm down before I could think. I told my boss I would be late by calling them. After that, I called George. He would understand. We had known each other for a long time. George and his wife broke up a few years ago after he found out she wasn't being honest with him. Back then, we hung out a lot and talked things over. George is now a captain in the Air National Guard and is in charge of keeping the base safe. He jumped right back to work after his breakup and quickly moved up the ladder. In his last job, he was in charge of keeping the place safe. He picked up the phone right away when I called. He asked, hey, how are you? I replied, not good. I believe Marge is seeing someone else. He told David, oh man, that's rough. I'll do what I can to help. Do you want to come by now? Yes, I said. He softly added, I hope I'm wrong, but you're right most of the time. Let's find out. We sat down to talk after I went over. We had a plan after an hour. George gave me five small recorders that were the same as the ones he used before. I went home. Marge's car wasn't there. I kept one recorder for her car and put four in the house. It was cooler there than before. The heat was lowered. Marge might have been hot last night. I checked out her closet. I saw bold new clothes I hadn't seen before. She may have bought them but then didn't want to wear them all the time. New underwear that I hadn't seen before was in the back of a drawer. Some of them looked like they were torn off. I felt awful about that. I looked at them for a long time. After that, I went to work and left at 3. It was late when I got home from work, so I called Marge's cell phone and left a message. That night, when I finally got home, I stole the last voice bug into Marge's car and then went to sleep. I also made sure to go to sleep after Marge on Friday night. She was either out in the cold or having fun. That night, I checked the voice bugs but didn't find anything interesting. Like every Saturday, I fed the kids breakfast early so Marge could sleep in. It was my turn to sleep late on Sunday. I cleaned the kitchen and put Marge's breakfast in the microwave after the kids ran off to watch TV. After that, I connected the Allen cable to my laptop, logged in, and turned off the Wi-Fi. March found a note by the microwave that said I was outside, so she knew I was gone. I then went to work in the yard. After about two hours, March came out upset that her laptop wouldn't connect to Wi-Fi. We went inside. Even though my laptop seemed fine, I told her we should check hers. She stayed close to her laptop and me because she seemed tense. She got bored and fell asleep while I faked some tech moves. I put a memory stick into her laptop and set up a spy program every time she left. I set it up to record every keystroke, take a picture of the screen every 30 seconds, keep track of all the websites she visited, and get all of her emails, even the ones she deleted or sent. After she went off again, I fixed my laptop's Wi-Fi, made sure hers was back online, and went to show her. I told her the hard drive was a mess. It was the cleanup tool. When she was done with the day, I told her to press this button to let it run all night. That way, my spy tool would also send me everything it found. She put her arms around my neck, kissed me, and said, thanks, big guy. How can I repay you, with a wink? How about you wash my car? I asked with a smile. I gave her a light tap on the behind. It looked like she was ready for something else. I kissed her on the cheek and joked, just kidding, I need to get back to work. Then I left and she went back to cutting the grass. I knew I was being silly, but I couldn't let her think I was cheating on her without proof. I had to act like everything was fine for now, so I chose to work hard today and be too tired to do anything at night. After that, we watched movies with the kids. 
It felt good for Marge to be close. A few times during the movie, she got a little silly. I got a drink and stole one of Marge's Xanax when the second movie was almost over. I thought it would knock me out in about 45 minutes. Yes, after 15 minutes, Marge had to wake me up. I told them I was tired from working all day and was going to bed. Even more so when the kids asked her to stay for another movie, Marge looked sad. I passed out because I didn't know when she would come back. I usually sleep in on Sundays, but I got up at 5 a.m. To avoid any early surprises, I didn't want to be there when Marge woke up. It was time to check on her stuff. As I left, I turned off her alarm and turned on my phone. I realized that the fact that she skipped a CC would definitely make me suspicious. My computer has a password that I set up with the Keylogger program. There were about 500 emails in a secret folder, so I began to read them. It was the oldest emails that the Keylogger showed first. I looked at messages from six months ago. Two of them were from a person named Bill Perez. He had his own website, but they talked about her work. They might have worked together. This could be the person whose email I found, sent four months ago and with the title. I read it. It wasn't too bad, but this guy seemed to be trying to impress her. He found his name on the web. He didn't have a website, as I quickly saw. I put them in order by date and saw that old Willie sent six yesterday. Not a surprise, Marge couldn't take her eyes off her laptop. She was afraid that I would read her emails. The new book was the first thing I read as my world fell apart. It started at the end, where she was mad at him for leaving marks on her and how hard it was for her to hide them from me. He told her, sorry about that, move on, and forget about your husband. After 14 minutes, she gave a crazy answer. One part told me a lot. She told him, I know you don't love your wife, but I do love my husband. I don't wish to hurt him or our relationship. It's bad enough that I haven't been close to him much. With your marks, I can't even let him see me naked. I'm not coming to see you on Wednesday. It was interesting, but it didn't change anything. He told her he was sorry, that he'd be nicer, and that he'd take her somewhere sunny if she could sneak away for the next two. He told her he loved her a lot. In her last one, she was glad he understood what she meant. She would only take trips with her husband so she wasn't going to their Wednesday get-together. She thought the marks would go away in a week, and then she would spend time with her husband making things right. There were more details in other emails. They had been dating for two months. At a nearby hotel, where his company had a room for sales reps, they met. She got directions in one email. It said that the business had a room, 187, and it had had it for two years. It was the motel across the street from the bar I was at before. After that, he sent another email. It was a reply to the one she sent the night before, and it made me feel dizzy all over again. His message said she needed to see him this week and that they could meet on Wednesday at noon. This time, she told him to be soft. He told her how great she was and how he would make things nice for her in his answer. I knew then that they both had to take responsibility for what they did. I had to make plans and asked George to help me. I sent George the emails that could help him and then began making breakfast. Marge came down around 9.30 and was glad I let her sleep. I told her it was fine because I went to bed early the night before. She gave me a hug and told me not to work too hard today. I need you right now. I skipped the last part and told her I still had some work to do. I moved away and told you to begin. It looked like she was upset as I left. I saw her try to hide it, but I caught her. She should call me if she needs anything. She said okay in a weak way. It was time to clean the garage when George called. He asked first if we could talk. I said yes outside. He told me he felt bad for me after reading the emails. I told him I was sorry, but at least I knew. That's true, but you don't have strong proof yet, he told her. I thought that the motel would be a good place to try to do that. You can ask us to do a lot more. He told them they couldn't use that in court. Tell me more. He had looked into bad things at that motel before. The owner was a good person who didn't like bad people or drug users hanging out there. He told me to call him tomorrow and get the key to that room. Because I need it for work right now. So we can set up hidden cameras, we need to know when Perez isn't there. He told me that's how I caught my ex. I quickly replied, yes, I want that. To get him and catch her. Can you find information about him? I'll start on that on Monday morning. We should try to set up the cams on Monday or Tuesday. 
He said it would take about an hour. We talked some more. George said that the equipment moves and sends things to a receiver within 100 feet. It starts with sound. He was going to use a service room to hide the receiver. My only task was to park close to the motel and turn on the receiver in my car. People who got the first message also sent things. It promised to send me its data and then erase its memory. It could take two hours to get a full day's worth of video. The rest of Sunday went by quickly. After a short time in bed, I thought about going to sleep in ten minutes. After that, I chose not to. When she came to bed that night, I pretended to be asleep. After checking once, she turned over and went to sleep. I called my job Monday morning and left before anyone else. I told you I wouldn't come in today, so I went to George's. He told me that he had talked to the morgue manager and learned something. It turns out that our guy is seeing at least three women in his bunker. He must think he's smart to use the same spot for a full-time room, but he's not. George also heard the boss say that Perez was a pain for the staff. Perez worked in the room a few times a week, but he rarely came before 11 a.m. This was the last piece of news. George said, okay, let's go. We quickly got to the motel by putting our stuff in George's van. George rang the boss's doorbell and told him I was helping him with some work and might be around from time to time. Kevin, the manager, said it was fine, but he didn't want any bad things to happen at his place. He showed us on a map where the room was and gave George the key. About 50 feet away, there was a utility room. Kevin made a key for George right away when he asked for one for that room as well. Kevin then called Perez's room to see if he was there. Nothing. Kevin may have driven the van close to the room. After knocking a few times, George used the key to get in. There was no one there. Thought about my wife with another man in that bed for a second and stopped moving. After that, I began to help. We set up and tested everything in less than two hours. I saw a place on the table for a laptop as we were leaving. George, look. This is where he keeps his laptop. I almost said it out loud, I can put a tracker on it if I can get to it when he's gone. George said, maybe he leaves it when he goes to eat. I replied, if I have to, I'll watch this spot all day. I want to find his car first so that we don't get caught off guard. He told me not to hurry. Do you get it? We must not mess this up. Let's leave now. For lunch, how about that place across the street? The food is good, and they have a new bartender. It's nice to talk to her. I'm in. George said, I'm hungry. When we got there, the bar was empty. I was the first one to walk in. Mary, who worked at the bar, saw me and smiled and waved. George then came up behind me. Mary looked shocked. It didn't bother her that she let the towel fall, stopped cleaning, and walked right up to us. George, it's great to see you, she told him with a big hug. He gave her a second hug and told her, Mary, I've been thinking about you. Yay, it looks like you're getting better. She moved away from him, but she still held on to him. Things aren't perfect yet, but they're getting better. From far away, you helped a lot. I tried to tell them about George, but they laughed. Mary took my hand, said, I've liked you since the first time we met, and she let go of George. It means a lot to me that you're friends with George. I smiled. He's okay, but he can be a pain. She smiled back. I'd known George for a while, but I'd never thought of him as a bother. It must be something guys do. Mary kept coming back to talk with us even while she served other people drinks. She said she was saving hard for nurse school that starts in five months. By two o'clock, George and I were the only ones left. When I told Mary how quiet it was, she said it's always like this because she doesn't get tips, which is tough, but she studies during this time. She then smiled at both of us and said, but it's nicer to talk to you guys. We talked some more until Mary looked serious and told George, I'm going to tell him. George did nothing but look at her. She looked at me. I don't want us to keep secrets if we're going to be friends. After I tell you, you might not like me. I get it, but I'm not going to hide who I am. I don't want someone else to tell you. She reached out to grab George's hand. She held it close and said, let me tell you how I met George. I was caught. He dragged me to a dirty cell in his cold, dark home. When I saw the cell, I broke down. It didn't bother him. He pushed me inside and began to shut the door. He stopped and watched me cry after that. He got mad at me and told me I was destroying my life and being stupid. 
Then I saw that he wasn't yelling at me, even though I was. He told me I was hurting myself. I had never heard that before, but I heard him then. I lost it. I cried a lot when I fell on that awful, dirty bed. George sat next to me and didn't say anything. She told me through tears, he asked me why. That's it. She looked at George and said, I told someone everything for the first and last time in my life, crying out loud at times. It was a long time ago. George had to have been there for a long time. He looked at me for a long time after I was done. After that, he stood up, lightly touched my shoulder, and locked me in that cell. I was left there for 14 hours. I didn't see or hear anyone. As I came down from a high, I was cold and hungry the whole time. He finally came back and told me it was time to go see the judge. You get to clean up and put on a new jail suit before going to court most of the time. Not me. He made me do what I did. The defense didn't say anything. George spoke up and asked to speak to the judge. The judge was about to jail me. I will always remember what he said and how he looked in his dress. I still remember every word. The important thing is that he told the judge that I shouldn't go to jail. He wanted me to go to rehab. The judge and the lawyer were shocked for a reason. I got caught doing bad things and was in a lot of trouble. George said I did them. Then George, who was tough, joined my team. The judge gave me a chance after some thought. I would spend 90 days in rehab and would have to wait four long years if I did something wrong. I did it. I looked at George and said, since George caught me, I haven't done any bad things. She looked at us and said in a soft voice, George, David, I don't walk the streets anymore, but I still do what I did. I have to do it to save money for school and take care of my kid. I understand, though, if you two no longer wish to speak with me. I'm sorry, George. After that, I got hugs from both sides. George told her, I'm with you as long as you fight, and you'll win. I know you. I also told Mary, I'm glad we met and am now friends. We were lucky to be in a quiet part of the bar. Mary just cried while she held us. On Monday night at 5.30, Marge showed up with Chinese food. She tried to kiss me, but I just grabbed the bags and told her, great, we're all hungry. She looked scared when I turned around. I told them to change, and I would set things up. I started to get plates ready as she turned white. She tried to talk, but she didn't. I was still mad at her for lying to me last night. The kids knew it was quiet at dinner, but they didn't say anything. I made sure I ate a lot, but Marge didn't. I didn't really listen when Marge tried to talk. So I knew I was being stupid. I didn't want her to end things before I found proof, and being mad now was giving me away. I shook my head and told everyone I was sorry. My thoughts kept going back to work after I got home. Let's do it again. How was your day, everyone? We tried to act normal while we talked over dinner. I smiled at Marge a few times and paid attention to what she had to say. Marge went to sleep before I did. I raised the temperature a little. It took me an hour to listen to the voice tapes and find nothing interesting. I went to our room. Around 77 degrees felt really hot. I got ready for bed, laid down, and turned my back on her. She said, Good night, honey. I asked, Why are you wearing that thick top, without turning around? It's really hot in here. After a short pause, she said, I'm just cold. I put in a little more effort. I gave her a hug. She gave me a hug back, but she was hot. Are you not feeling well? I asked out of worry. She said, I don't think so. I've just been cold at night. I pulled her close and said, I know ways to make you warm. She tensed and said, David, I'm sorry. I'm just too tired. I turned away and said, it's okay, Marge. She moved closer and said, I'm too tired tonight, but how about Wednesday? It'll be a light day for me. I'll make it up to you then. I just murmured, it's fine. After a bit, she went back to her side. It was weird on Tuesday morning. Like always, I went to work. George told me that last night he put a GPS on Perez's car and gave me the link to track it. I saw Perez across town. I chose to listen to the voice recorder in the bedroom. I told my boss I'd be back in a few hours and then I went home. On Monday morning, Marge heard from her best friend Ashley. Marge told her right away that she had a great weekend. I was happy for Ashley. Have you been seeing Will lately? Ashley was interested. It made me wonder if her boyfriend Mike knew but told no one else. 
That jerk. Oh no, I meant to be with David this Sunday night but it didn't work out. She said, I was going to be with him Saturday night like we always do, but he worked all day and was too tired. Does David have better sex than Will? Then Ashley shot back. Marge said it was always better to be with David. Then why are you with Will? She asked with a smile. Marge said, it's different. David cares about me. I feel so safe when I'm with him. Will hits it straight on. I like how David treats me now, but I don't want him to do that again. Both are good, though. It does sound strange, doesn't it? It does for me, friend. It's the thrill, the raw heat, and putting out your legs for someone special. Yes, that's why I began seeing Brian Sears a year ago. I know, that's why I began seeing Brian Sears a year ago. She then laughed. Plus, he's so big, Marge laughed too. That's also why you broke up with him. You walked funny because you were so big. I was always hurting after being with him, God. It's soft, but it's thick. Play with it or just look at it and think, damn. She then said, hey, Mike will be gone for five days next month. I believe I will let Brian have me for the first day. I'll be hurt for a few days, but I should be fine when Mike gets back. Really? I thought you were done with him, damn it. I was. We've been in touch since last year, but I think Mike is still onto something. I chose to treat myself since Mike is away for five days. Marge told her, you have to tell me everything. Ashley replied, only if you spill with Will and David on Wednesday. It was all the juicy details, Marge said. Okay? Ash then asked, how's your breast? She told David, the mark is getting lighter, but I can't let you see it for a few more days. Changing in the bathroom and at night putting on flannels. Ashley asked if he had seen. Watch out. Did he say anything about not having sex? No, but I need to take care of that. She laughed and said, yes, I want to be with David on Wednesday night. I've never been able to do this before. She said, I've never had two guys in one day before. It's something I've done before. It's really cool. Before you go see David, just make sure you get a cleanup kit. It really cleans. Marge said she would. After that, they said goodbye. Marge, no way. Bad girl. Ashley was also mean. Should I tell Mike, which could make his life worse? That's not good. Then I thought he might be mad at me for not telling him. He would want to know if I like him. After I take care of Perez, I'll give him this tape. The next important call came this morning from Ashley. Their talk was not the same as it was on Monday. A call from Marge to Ashley said hello. Ashley saw that Marge was in a bad mood and asked what was wrong. David saw that I was wearing thick pajamas and locked the door so I couldn't change. When we went to bed, he asked about it. Ash, I told you I was cold, but it was really hot. Those thick pajamas made me sweat all night. He didn't say anything else, so I don't think he bought it. Then David came over, but I wouldn't let him see the marks. I took the nightlight out of the wall on Sunday, but David fixed it, so I said no again. He was mad. I told him we could be closed this Wednesday to make things right, but he didn't seem to care. We were so far apart when we laid down. Even worse, I couldn't stop thinking about Will instead of David. That file was saved. I already knew what I needed to hear. I looked up how to find other men and had a kit sent to my office. After that, I went to the motel. There was Perez's car. It was time for lunch. I went to a bar. From my window, I could see Perez reading a menu while sitting in a booth. Mary wasn't there. It seemed like the right time. I went to his motel door and knocked. It was empty, so I used my key to get in. This time, I didn't look at the bed. Instead, I went straight to the other room. There, his laptop was open and a page from QuickBooks was visible. I got my thumb drive, plugged it into his laptop, and set up a program that would record what he typed. This time, I didn't take any screenshots, but I did keep track of all emails, sites visited, key presses, and data, even the accounting ones. I was going to catch him if he was doing something bad. Then I used his remote desktop to look for the right port on the motel's Wi-Fi, which was open. I then made an account on a site that lets you use a basic version of remote control software for free. I used his domain name. This software was put on his laptop so that I could use it from anywhere and see his desktop on my own. 
The site keeps track of IP addresses, which proves it was set up on the network of the motel. I took the icons off the start menu and desktop. I quickly left the room after bringing up the QuickBooks page again. I went back to work and worked for a few hours. When I got home, I felt pretty good. I was happy and helped Marge and the kids. She looked scared when I first got there, but she calmed down when she saw how normal I was. Around 10, she told me it was time for bed. She told me I should get some work done and then go to bed. She said, great, see you in the morning. I thought, great. Get a good night's sleep for your lover tomorrow. Today I had to sort through a lot of information, like the phone records, files from Willie and Marge's computers, and more. But not tonight. After getting the data, I put the car recorder back in Marge's car. When I got into bed, she might have been asleep or just lying there. Thought about what would happen tomorrow as I tried to sleep and stayed away from her as much as possible. The next morning, Marge was up before me, which was fine with me. I was scared to death because I knew she would cheat on me again today, and I would have to watch the video of her with someone else. She was almost done making breakfast when I got there. She was also dressed for work. Dear, you're just in time. Good morning, she said. I made a noise and went to get coffee. When I looked at her after a few sips, I saw that she was lost. I said, sorry, I'm still half asleep. It's just that you're not yourself in the morning, she told him. You now understand how I feel most of the time. I just sat down and drank without saying anything. She began setting out food for the kids as they came in. She cooks alone today, which is rare for me to help. Even though I didn't look at her, I could tell she was looking at me from the corner of my eye. She stopped and gave me a good look. I looked at the door and didn't see it. Just before I left, she stood in my way and asked me in a low voice, David, is something wrong? I gave her a blank look and told her, I don't think so. After that, I gave her a big, loving hug. She felt better when I hugged her and said, I'm glad, I was worried. I told her, I love you, I can't imagine my life without you, and I want to be with no one else. After a short pause, I said, I hope you feel the same way about me. She stiffened up, made a crying sound, and grabbed me even tighter. Of course I do, she said. She then said in a whisper, I'm going to make you very happy tonight. I pushed her away hard and left without giving her another look. I drove to the motel and began downloading the files while I waited for Marge to leave for work. I got home just after 9 in the morning. I thought about how to handle the day the whole time I was in the parking lot. How could I be normal when she was around? What was I going to do? I couldn't stand to watch the video of her with another guy. It took a while to get the data from the bugs. As it changed hands, I wandered around the house without a plan. It didn't make sense to me to talk to Marge tonight, let alone sleep with her. I started with his emails. Some simple things clicked for me after a while. He was in charge of three businesses that bought cheap goods and sold them to the government, the military base nearby, and some big businesses. The sneaky jerk seemed to be cheating on my wife with five other women. He got a lot of emails about the facts and quality of the products. I saved some emails to read later. It wasn't much yet, but it was a start. Then I used a keylogger to get his usernames and passwords and copied his three QuickBooks company files. Also, I didn't get much from that. I'm not an expert on money matters. In the bills, I did see that he had six business cards. In the notes for each one, he even wrote down the card number. It took a long time to listen to his phone calls, but it was worth it in the end. Some emails and phone calls with him made me start to put some pieces together. One call came from someone who works in shipping and is very busy. He said there was a problem with the last order because some of the serial numbers were repeated. It got even worse, each new order had to have its own unique serial number. That made Perez very angry, and he made it clear that he was not happy. It was important to be careful with the new checking software, the person on the phone said. Perez hung up the phone and then went online to buy two high-tech printers and other things for them. Then a salesman called him. Willie Boy kept going around in circles until he finally said, it takes a long time to get permission to sell things, but I like you and can help. The big boss in charge of shopping at the base listens to the person who helps him shop. You have to pay me to get that helper to work for you. You can sell the base goods worth $100,000 for $5,000 in cash. You can make your prices a little more fair. The next time, it will cost less. That made the guy sound less sad. Okay. How do I give the money to you? Perez asked. When you're ready, I'll tell you. 
They will choose your bid in two days. Thanks. I'll call you soon. Then he got a call from someone who works at the base, where Marge works, and buys things. This person told Perez how much other sellers had asked for some items. Besides that, he got four more important calls. It was from my wife. I heard the same call from the car bug. I thought it was time to get things in order while I was on break. I put videos, sounds, information, and other things on my flash drive by making folders. I copied everything and put it all in these folders. After that, it was time to call George. He felt sorry for me for a while. Then I told him I needed his help with his job. He paid close attention. He said, great after I told him everything. What you found in court can't help me. It does help with what I was checking, though. The shipping and receiving area has been on our list for a while now. Things get lost, sometimes whole loads of them. There is nothing wrong with the records either. Some items in the storage had the same ID number and were not good enough, so I had to check it out. I told him we needed to look at this right away. I told her I had to leave the house before she got back. He said we could meet up at your place later. I said, no, let's meet at my apartment at 3 p.m. I did not want other people to know yet. We can drink and I'll cook. You didn't drive. George said in a stern voice, you'll drink. We hung up the phone after I said yes. That was my plan at the time. I would get drunk with George in the evening. Marge would be asleep when I got home. And I might have been too drunk to see her the next day. We hung up the phone after I said yes. That was my plan at the time. Spend the night getting drunk with George. Marge would be asleep when I got home. And I might have been too drunk to see her the next day. It broke my heart. It was almost noon. And she was about to meet him. When I called Marge, I got her voicemail. She might not have wanted to talk. I told her I would be late getting home because I was with George. After that, I looked at video files from Monday to now. What I saw at first shocked me. A woman with her own key came an early Monday morning. He gave her a tight hug and kissed her a lot. After that, they went to bed. That video is saved. He spent a short time with a cleaner on Tuesday. That night, another cleaner showed up. He gave her cash. In return, she did things. I also saved those videos. It was time to see George. I gave him extra copies. George picked me up, and we looked at what I found for about two hours. After that, we went to a bar. It was around midnight. I remember when we left, but not much else. I woke up around 9 a.m. on Thursday. There were no kids or Marge in the house. A note was on the table. I forgot to set my alarm because I had too much to drink the night before. It was clear she was mad when she said, I won't wake you. I thought that was good. It's easier for me to stay away. I called my boss and said I was sick. Then I left to get a scary video from the motel. George called while I was on my way back. He told us that our case was moving quickly now. The person who was ready to talk about the $5,000 bribe was going to record conversations in secret. People saw Perez and his group being sneaky, and a report was sent to the people in charge. It's possible that the military police will soon check out Perez's office, motel, and home. They were going to look through his computers, so I had to hide my tracks. George wanted me to wait 10 days before talking to Marge because he thought the raid might start then. After that, he told a big secret. Marge was now thought to be guilty. At first, I thought Marge would never steal. I did think Marge wouldn't cheat, though. We agreed to talk again the next day. When I got home, I looked up information about the motel and the house. I started watching the video from Wednesday around noon and stopped. Next, I looked over his emails and saw that two other sellers were probably paying Perez off. I gave them to George. Some emails were from women making plans to meet up. I wrote it down. I thought Perez would be too busy to see me looking around, but I had to face it. I couldn't wait any longer to watch the video with Marge. I quickly skipped ahead to when he opened the door and my wife walked in. I stopped the video and sat there, sad, angry, sick, empty, and broken. I felt many things, some of which I couldn't even put into words. When I hit play, I saw them deeply hug and kiss, but she told him not to be so rough. As they undressed and got on the bed, they touched each other and I cried. They didn't say much. 
His touch on her, along with the fact that she seemed to enjoy it, made me feel very bad. I skipped ahead until I saw her get into bed. She was ready for someone else. It was quiet that Thursday night. The kids were not there. Marge and I did our own things and didn't talk much. I changed the data card in her car and looked at it after everyone went to sleep. It looked like she talked to Ashley on her way to work, so I had to look at the card information. Marge called the house phone, but I wasn't there because I was still drunk and couldn't be in the kitchen where the kids could hear. Yes, Ashley did call to see how things went. Will was okay with it, according to Marge. I made him less rough, so today I'm not hurt. I just feel a little used. He's still too mean. Is forcing me to do things I don't want to do. She said it was fine, though. Still? It was Ashley. What about David, though? He either came in too early or couldn't get going, right? Marge let out a heavy sigh. He didn't come, though. Out with a friend and drank. I got drunk and crashed when I got home too late. Not a word to me. What did you do? How could I? I was so mad that he just snored. I turned off his alarm in the morning, left a sharp note, and then left. Ashley said, you know, sometimes it's just bad timing. But Marge yelled out again. No, I told him last night that I wanted him. I even told him in the morning that I was going to make him tired that night. He didn't say anything, not even goodbye, as he left for work. Ashley was not sure if he was telling the truth or just being strange. But Marge was sure he didn't know. She was only with Will when David wasn't around. She believed David was mad that they weren't spending as much time together. As a way to get back at her, he was now keeping quiet. Ashley said, that doesn't seem likely. But Marge was sure of it. She thought that last night was her last chance to be with David. But he didn't let her talk. Even though it hurt, she really wanted both of them. She was determined to ignore David for a while. Ashley kind of laughed. Marge, it's not his fault that you want both of them. Drop it for now. In her words, David probably felt left out because he wasn't close. And Marge had to fix that before she could dream of having both men. Marge said that was her goal, to spend more time with David. Ashley said that you made it about what you wanted instead of what he needed. Now what? Marge asked. You're right. Ashley told her to just drop it. His lack of attention to you might not have been intentional. Think he didn't do it and don't worry about it. David could show up tonight. Marge hoped that she had made Ashley so mad that she would leave her alone. She called again, though. Ash asked, why do you let Will make you do things you don't want to do? Will was just being too pushy, according to Marge. He is a little kinder now, but he's still pretty rough around the edges. She asked, like, what does he make you do? Just one thing, Marge said, not sure what to say. He made me kneel on the floor with my head against the bed yesterday. Then he quickly moved and put his stuff in my mouth. It hurt like hell every time he moved, though, because he did it so hard. I couldn't get away because I was against the bed. She said, that's rough. He also likes dirty talk and wants me to say some pretty dirty things. I think it's silly, but he likes it. Ashley told the men. Yes, Marge agreed. I believe he believes those adult movies are real. He wouldn't stop until I told him, I love your bits, in a very sexy voice. Strangely, it got better after I said it. Marge tried to start something on Thursday, but I didn't join in. It was almost 2 a.m. She was already asleep when I finally went to bed. Ash, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Friday morning, I got up early and went to work right away. Around 3, I left with the test kit and went to the motel to get the videos from Thursday and today. Even though Mary wasn't at the bar, I got a drink to pass the time. First, I used the test kit on Marge's underwear when I got home to start moving the files. Even though the test came back positive, nothing changed. I had time to watch the new videos, which again shocked me. In the first video, a young woman dressed as a soldier walked into his room. She looked young, maybe 20 or 21 years old, and not very tall. They drank some wine together. Eventually, he got closer to her and touched her while they kissed and hugged. He started to take off her clothes, but she quickly stopped him saying she was uncomfortable and didn't want to go any further. She tried to leave, but he held her there against her will, which made things worse. Even though she tried to get away, he held her down and became angry. I was unable to view. I closed the file and ran to the bathroom. 
I made a copy for George to see when I felt a little better. After that, I opened one more file. He gave Mary cash this time, and they hooked up. Even though she said she was a hooker, it was still strange to see. I saw two more files, both of which were new today. He called Marge and asked her to come over in one. She laughed and said yes. Marge showed up in the last one, they kissed, and she did some things. After that, she left like it wasn't a big deal. Also, I saved these for George. I called George and told him we had to get together soon. He told me to invite him over, but it was dangerous. We met at his place of work. I got there quickly, drove him there, and told him that the first one was the worst. I'm sorry you have to see it. I'm going to wait in my car. George finally came out and joined me after a long time. He said, Perez will feel bad about what he did when I find out who she is. He then said, let's go. Not for drinks, but to see what's going on. For Mary. Mary went to the bar but didn't work there. She waved to the bartender and asked for two gin and tonics when she saw us. He set them down for us, and she hugged George, squeezed my hand, and said, Hi, guys. Also, it's always nice to see you. Right away, I said, Hi, Mary. It's great to see you. George asked her, Mary, what's up, but she didn't answer. She looked sad and told George, You got it again. I got sick from CC. That's the reason I can't work at the bar. I do not want to make anyone else sick because I am sick. I am no longer willing to sell my body or go to school. I'm not going to sell myself or become a nurse until I need to. George jumped in quickly. You still have school to do. That's not true, Mary said. I can get by with this job if I don't save for school. That's enough for now. George got mad, grabbed her arm, and told her, no, that's not good enough. That day in jail, you wanted to be a nurse, and you've been working every day to make that happen. It's good that you no longer have to sell yourself, but I won't let you give up. Mary, I told you, we'll find another way. With tears in her eyes, she told us, I couldn't ask for better friends, but I can't and won't ask you guys to help. That's not right. George and I looked at each other. Okay, you didn't ask, and you can't stop us from talking about it now, so I said. After laughing, I said something new. I asked George, are there any jobs open at the base? His words were cut off before they could be said by Mary. She told the guys, you need to know two things. To begin, I know that you all kept an eye on Will Perez. Outside the bar, I can see the door to his room. I hope you catch him soon. George gave a stone-faced nod. When I found out he made me sick, the first thing I did was make him sick too. My jaw dropped. Why? I wanted to make him feel bad, so she gave me a mean look. George asked Mary in a dark voice, what did he do to you? He hurt a young woman, but it didn't matter to me. Not a boy, a girl. On my way to work, I saw her walking out of his place in a strange way. She was having a hard time standing. I tried to help her. She had a sob. Her face was red and hurt. Her dress was torn. I was only allowed to walk her to her car. After that, she drove off. What did Mary say to George? She looked like she was in the Air National Guard and might have been 20. She's one of yours. George said, I know. I'll find her and make sure she gets help. He'll feel bad about what he did afterward. He looked at me and said, I think David has some plans he hasn't told anyone about yet. We can talk. It was almost midnight when I went to sleep. George already knew what I was thinking, and Marge was already asleep. He also asked Mary if she could work at base and buy things. They had to quickly hire people for some jobs. Saturday was not busy. I didn't talk to Marge much. As usual, we watched a movie. When I came over with drinks, Marge was sitting in the middle of the couch with Tom and Julia next to her. Most of the time, Marge and I sit together, and our kids sit on the couch next to us. I sat down because Tom and Julia looked confused and Marge looked proud. Marge went to sleep early. I checked the voice recorders during that time but didn't find anything. Through email, Perez thanked her for Friday and said he looked forward to next Wednesday. On Sunday, we didn't really talk. We did nothing and pretended everything was fine. I went to sleep before Marge, but I saw her still going to the bathroom to change. She had to know that lying and cheating on us hurt us a lot. There was a bit of a jerk as she got into bed, just to make sure I felt it. When she turned her back on me, I didn't say anything. That was fine with me. 
she could stay sick. George called me on Monday. He said they found the lady who was attacked. She went to a nearby hospital and talked with some people before she was ready to speak out against Perez. He also told me that they were going to break in early on Monday. He hoped I would stay away from Marge this week so I wouldn't mess up with Perez. Yeah, I agreed. I told Marge I would be gone from Wednesday to Sunday, but I was really going to book a room at the motel and carry out the plan I told him about. Next, I called Kevin at the motel and reserved the five-day room right above Perez's. Sunday through Wednesday I was going to be gone. I told Marge and the kids about it at dinner on Monday. Judy and Tom were upset. Marge didn't do much. Tuesday, Marge and I didn't talk much. I put a bag in my car after everyone went to sleep. I listened to the tapes. I heard one conversation. This morning, it was Marge talking to Ashley. Ashley, Marge told you that Jerk was making a mess. Will or David? Ashley seemed to be lost. David? This morning I talked to Ashley. Ashley, Marge told you that Jerk was making a mess. Will or David? It sounded like Ashley was lost. David? We've been away. We just haven't talked in days. Last night, he told me he was leaving early Wednesday morning and wouldn't be back until Sunday. That means I won't be able to have fun with both of them on the same day. Oh no, Ashley left. Marge, you should work things out with your husband first before you dream big. This is going on for too long. Yes, Marge spoke. David should stop being so annoying. I'd make his day better. I don't understand why he makes things tough. Okay, I thought, she's joking around while I'm being tough. Still, I saved the file. Wednesday, I got to work early but left at noon to check into the hotel. For the next few days, I set up the video gear in the room with two laptops that I took out of my car. I could check my email and watch the live feed at the same time. Then I let it sit until about 1. I saw Marge come in through the window and walk to her room. She turned on the live feed on her laptop. She kissed and hugged Perez. She said she had to check her email first, then turn on her laptop and connect it to the hotel's Wi-Fi. For about 10 minutes, they were both working on their computers. At the moment she said she was done, he picked her up and took her to bed. He told her, baby, I need to be with you, as he put her down. She kissed him close and told him, I need you to be with me. I turned down the sound and used my laptop to log into Perez's. I got into Marge's laptop from his while they were taking off their clothes. After that I was busy. For almost two hours, they were deeply and rough together. Then they held each other while they slept. They got up around 5 p.m., giving me four hours to look through their computers. I logged out but kept watching when they started to move. She woke up first and looked around, seeing the time. Then she saw him. Will, wake up, honey, she pushed him awake. We fell asleep. He grunted to wake up and then laid back down. He asked what time it was. A little after five. She said, I have to go. He replied, me too. I promised my wife a fancy dinner. It was a light hit. I don't want to hear that. I hear too much about your kids and husband. As he got up, he said, don't forget. He was stopped by her. I'm sorry, honey, I said that. I love my life. Just sometimes I feel envious when I see you with your wife. We're having a hard time with what we're doing, he told her. I'm glad you haven't been seeing your husband late. I like the idea that your body is only for me, she replied. You don't own it. I've decided to tell you about it. But I love my boyfriend and need to fix things with him. I haven't talked to him in weeks. I love being with you. Know that you make me happy. He took a step back and said, but I can't mess up my marriage. Hey, I also can't tell my wife. He said, man, my shoulders hurt a lot as he stood up. She was shocked and told Will, I'm sorry I scratched you. I really am. He went to the mirror to look at his cuts. He said, man, you really got me. She cried as she got out of bed, I'm so sorry. As she stood up, she cried out in pain. I'm sorry, she screamed when she touched the sore spot. You jerk, you said you'd be nice. After a short fight, they got dressed. They were both quiet. He gave her a deep kiss as they got to the door and told her, I love you, baby, but we need to be careful. They didn't hold hands as they left. I saw her leave as she walked to her car. 
I stayed in the room because I knew she wouldn't be back for a while. I had reached my first goal. Now comes the hard part, we have to wait until next Monday. Up until then, I could keep an eye on them more. She booked the same room at the hotel for 1 p.m. on Thursday and then went to work. I didn't come home on Friday. I told Marge I'd be away until Sunday as I left. She kissed me and told me, I can't wait for you to come back. I got a hug from the kids too. I hoped to find more interesting things when I got to the hotel. On Saturday, I looked through emails, texts, calls, and anything else that might lead me to a new lead. There's nothing new, Marge and Ashley have just been talking. Sunday was the same. I left late on Sunday night, hoping that Monday would go well. I got up early on Monday. I told Marge I'd be back later after making breakfast. She said it was fine, and after a quick kiss, she went to work. When I called George, I told him we had to get things ready. We got right to work after he agreed. We got right to work after he agreed. I was in George's office at the base when he got a call. The raid was going on. After about 30 minutes, we saw soldiers rush into Perez's home. He was caught in the act. A fake ID and boxes of goods ready to be shipped were found in his office. There was also proof that he paid the person who told him about the other sellers. It was all over the news that Perez had been arrested. To make sure everything went smoothly, the military police worked with local police and the FBI. People did a lot of illegal things in Perez's office. When computers were searched, they found a treasure trove of emails, financial records, and messages with his partners that pointed the finger at him. The search even went to his motel room, where hidden cameras and microphones caught all of his illegal meetings and bribery deals. As soon as Perez was arrested, bad things started to happen. A lot of news outlets wrote about the story, including how he was cheating people out of money and how corruption had spread to the Air National Guard base. His arrest shocked everyone in the community and led to several internal investigations and a thorough review of how things are bought to make sure they don't get abused again. More information about Perez's crimes came to light as his case went on in court. Several people, including the young woman he had raped, testified against him. The jury quickly found him guilty of many counts of fraud, bribery, and assault because there was so much evidence against him. Perez was given a 20-year federal prison sentence with no chance of parole. His name became linked to corruption, and all of the honors and titles that went with his career were taken away. At the same time, I had to talk to Marge about everything. In the living room, I was ready for her when she got home. She looked shocked that I was there so early. David, what's going on? She asked because she could feel the tension in the air. Marge, please sit down. I tried to keep my voice steady as I said, we need to talk. She sat down slowly, looking scared and confused in her eyes. What is it? I know about Perez. I looked her in the eyes and told her, I know everything. Her face turned pale, and she sank down in her seat. David, I don't. I watched the videos, read the emails, and heard the calls. You can't change what you've already done. I spoke up, my voice shaking with pain and anger. Marge lost it, and tears ran down her face. David, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. I love you. It was so hard for me to find my way. Please trust me. I took a deep breath and tried not to cry. Marge, you can't say sorry now. You betrayed our trust, and you can't take it back. I need to split up. She cried even more and hid her face in her hands. Do not do this. We can get through this. I can change. But I had already decided. Marge, it's over. This is not how I want to live. We need to care about the kids and do what's best for them. We need to move on. I chose to send the evidence, which included Marge's underwear, to a clinic for testing after seeing the videos of her with Perez. The results were really shocking. Five different men's DNA was found at the clinic, and Marge had an STD. I told Marge about this, and she was heartbroken. She went to the clinic and paid a lot of money for care. I also got checked, and thankfully, I didn't have any STDs. Over the next few weeks, there were a lot of court cases and emotional upheaval. The deal we made was that Julia and Tom would live with both of us at the same time. We sold our house and split the money equally. We also shared our savings and things in a fair way. Marge moved into a nearby small apartment while I looked for a new place for my family and me. There was a lot of pain and time spent on the divorce process. We had to go to mediation sessions to work out the specifics of who would have custody and how the assets would be split. 
My friend Marge and I both agreed to go to therapy in order to deal with our feelings. Julia and Tom were important to both of us, but the road ahead was not going to be easy. It's easy to see why Julia and Tom were so upset by the news. They knew we loved them and that nothing was their fault, so we sat them down together and told them what was going on. Though shocked and hurt, we promised to make the change as easy as possible. Marge felt guilty and bad about what she did. She moved into a small apartment nearby and worked on getting back together with her kids. She went to therapy to work through her problems and try to start over with her life. For the sake of the kids, we kept a friendly relationship by going to school events together and making sure the kids knew both of us were there for them. After the divorce, life was hard, but it also opened up new chances. I missed work for a while to take care of my mental health and be with Julia and Tom. We made new traditions and spent more time together, making good memories to balance out the bad ones from the past. Meeting up with old friends again helped me slowly get ready to date again. George stayed a loyal friend who always helped and supported me. His relationship with Mary grew stronger, and the two of them became important people in my support network. Mary did really well in her nursing class and felt like her life had a new purpose and direction. She also got a job at the base with George's help, which gave her stability and a sense of belonging. About a month after Marge left, I had a heart-to-heart -heart with Julia and Tom one evening. I looked at my kids and said, I know things have been hard. But we have each other, and we can get through this together. Julia answered yes, and her eyes were filled with determination. Dad, we will. We'll be fine. As Tom looked up from his game, his eyes showed a rare sign of weakness. Yes, Dad, we work together. I smiled because I was so proud of and loved my kids. Yes, we work together. My life got into a new rhythm over time. My main goals were to do well at work and be a great dad. I even went on another date, at first cautiously but with more and more hope for the future. Having friends like George and Mary there for me made a big difference in my ability to heal and move on. Marge worked on herself and her relationship with the kids even more. She was able to be there for Julia and Tom because she found a job that gave her flexible hours. We had less trouble getting along with each other, and we both tried to be good co-parents. My life's ending showed how strong people can be and how important it is to start over. The hurt was very real, but it also helped me grow as a person and make my relationship with my kids stronger. We got through tough times together and were stronger for it. I changed with the seasons. I learned to move on from the past and enjoy the start of something new. My story didn't end when my marriage did. It was the start of a new story, one full of hope, growth, and more good things to come. Julia and Tom kept doing well in school and figuring out what they wanted to do with their lives. Marge and I figured out how to live together peacefully while still putting our kids' needs first. The end of Perez's life was a stark reminder of what can happen when people are greedy and betray others. There were many effects of what he did, but justice was done. Even though it was hard, my journey took me to a place where I could heal and start over. With the help of family and friends, I put my life back together and was ready for whatever the future held.